Hey there, is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So welcome to church. Please join us as we sing our first song, Your Name. Our service is a little bit different today. But I hope you guys like it. Please join us. As morning dawns and evening fades, you inspire songs of praise that rise from earth to touch your heart and glorify your name, your name is a strong and mighty tower, your name is a shelter like no other, your name.
Welcome to Madison Campus Church. We hope you are blessed today by our service and our worship here today. Um, just want to remind you, as our goal, our, our goal here at Madison Campus is threefold. It's to remind us that we are here to love God, to love people, and to serve the world. And so when, when you come to Madison Campus, we want to remind you that, that first and foremost, the, the main objective of, of coming and, and fellowshipping with believers is to remind ourselves that, that we are called to love God. So we hope that today, during our worship service, that you can experience that, that love of God, like it's the first time, or remember when you fell in love with God for the first time. The other thing we want to remind you is, as Christians, we're called to love one another. And so we are to love others. And last of all, every day, day by day, week after week, month after month, year after year, we are called to serve the world. We're not just called to come together just to come together, and, and that's all, it's all good and all, but we're called to serve the world. And so here at Madison Campus, we strive to love God, love people, and serve the world. What I want us to do is just take a moment, take about a minute to greet one another. Uh, if you want to give someone a hug, give them a hug. If you want to give them a firm handshake or a soft handshake, uh, you could give them a soft handshake as well. Uh, have you guys ever had those? It's like you go in to get a handshake, and they're just like... They gave you like a little fish or something. Uh, but, but go ahead, greet one another, uh, hopefully someone you haven't met, and then we'll get back up here and we'll make a few other announcements. So, you can find your way back to your seat or back to a friend. Uh, we have a couple announcements coming up. Uh, may want to get your calendar out or just a pen and write it on your hand if you don't have a smartphone or a calendar available to you. Um, next week, not next week, two weeks from now, uh, two Wednesdays from now, our church has rented out a facility called Wave Country, and we're all going there. And we're all going to go have fun. And if you don't like water, but you like ice cream, uh, this is the place to go because we're also going to give you free ice cream if you show up. So if you're like, oh, I don't want to get my feet wet or I don't want to get my toes wet, don't worry, just come on out. There's chairs available and you can just chillax, which is relaxing and chilling at the same time. For those of you who don't understand sometimes my lingo, um, it's called chillaxing. And you can come, come and just chillax with us there at Wave Country and have a great time and you'll love it there. Uh, the other announcements are for men. And sorry, ladies, we're going to be biased today. We only have announcements for men. And so we have a father-son retreat coming up on September, September 16th through the 18th. It's right there on your newsletter. So if you haven't signed up yet, please sign up because space is limited. And, and eventually we'll, we'll create one for fathers father-daughter, but right now we're focusing on father-son. So if, you have, uh, if you're a father and you have a son and you want to come out to this retreat, please sign up and more information is on your newsletter. Last of all, also, if you're a guy um, and you want to attend our men's conference, our men's conference is happening in October. Uh, this year's theme is called Men of the Word, and it's based on uh, Micah 6.8. And so um, our men's conference is October 21st through the 23rd. There's also more information on that on your newsletter so please please go and sign up because we want you to be there and we want you to be blessed uh, once again welcome to madison campus church we hope you are blessed uh, by our service today this next song is called forever please join us this is probably a new song for some of you hope you can guys you guys can sing along
stars they went the morning sun was dead the savior of the world was fallen his body on a cross his blood poured out for us the weight of every curse upon As heaven looked away, the Son of God was laid in darkness. A battle in the grave, the war on death was waged, the power of hell forever broken. The ground began to shake, the stone was
Good morning, church family. How's everybody doing? Um, it is time for a children's story. So may every little children, child, come down front here <laughs> with offering as we get ready for the children's story. everybody doing good okay so today um well today we well I'm going to tell you a story or demonstration so does anybody know the famous verse John 3 16 can anybody tell me anybody want to For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, for whosoever believeth in him will not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16. Thank you. Thank you for that. So everybody knows that, well, everybody here believes in God, correct? Okay. So I need a volunteer. Anybody want to volunteer for me, please? Okay. Well, two of you can come. Come on. Can you guys hear me without the microphone? You guys can hear me? Okay, I'm going to put this down here for a moment. Okay, now go ahead and sit down, slow, well, that's fine too, you can sit down. Okay, so did you trust me? Why did you trust me? Because, because, uh, you're putting a lot of faith in me, right? You don't know me. I could have just said, yeah, you can sit down and almost fall, but you had faith that I was going to guide you in the right direction, correct? You can go ahead and sit down with them if you want. Um, basically, with that demonstration, it should give us an idea or have faith in leaning towards God and understanding that he will never leave us astray because he's going to guide us in everything we do. Who believes that? Anybody agree with me? Okay. Um, with him, everything is possible. So we should be able to put everything in him so he can help us through everything we do. Okay. Um, is there anybody who wants to pray for us? You want to pray? Okay. Let's bow our heads. Thank you, Jesus, for this perfect Sabbath. Please let's have a good Sabbath. And let us have 
A good son of Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you. You guys can go back to your seats. It is now time for our tithes and offerings. In the Jewish culture, the Feast of Harvest, which was known as the Feast of Weeks, was always celebrated at the end of May or in early June because that's when the early spring harvest came in. So seven weeks after the barley sheaf was offered, the first fruit offerings were brought into the temple. So we can look at this as an example. Our first fruit offerings doesn't have to be grains or fruits or things that we've grown. It could also be our time, our talents, and our resources. So our offering today is going towards our local church budget, which includes outreach ministries that help people in our very own community. So will you give your first fruits to God today? Please bow your heads with me. Dear Lord, Thank you so much for the opportunity that you give us to partner with you in affecting our community positively. Lord, we want to ask your blessings on these offerings today. Let them go towards your purpose. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. been following the news lately there's been a lot of chaos a lot of hatred and um, you know violence all over the place and I believe that there's a spiritual battle going on and the enemy is doing whatever he can to destroy us but on the flip side we have Jesus Christ that gives us hope and victory and as we sing this song Let's think about that, and may we all stand in His power so we can overcome. Please stand as we sing this next song, Christ Alone.
we thank you for this time. Thank you for your presence here today. I pray that you will take away every distraction, every thought that might hinder us from hearing your word today. Be with the sermon, be with the message so we can be blessed today and be with us for the rest of this day. In Jesus' name. Good morning, my name is Aaron, and I'm one of the worship coordinators here at Madison Campus. We are so glad you've chosen to worship with us today, and we invite you to join us on a regular basis as we seek to love God, love people, and serve the world. For more information about what's going on here at MCC, please visit us online at madisoncampus.org or on Facebook. Our weekly newsletter is also available from one of our greeters or from the kiosk located at each of the main entrances. Today, Pastor Ignacio is going to share with us from the book of Isaiah. In today's world, we often find it easy to rebuke others for their faults, to condemn them for not living up to standards that we believe they should be meeting. Unfortunately, our judgment usually makes us unwilling to reach out and lovingly lift people up. In Isaiah's story, we see the complete opposite. We see a God who loves his people enough to, to warn them of the consequences of their actions and to help them escape the troubles that are coming as a result. We hope you gain new insights into God's character as we explore together today part two in our sermon series, The Prophets, entitled Isaiah, A Redemptive Rebuke. Sabbath. If you weren't here last week, I encourage you to maybe go online and uh, stream it last week. That way you can get fully caught up to where we're at today. Uh, and if not, we have some, I think, DVDs and CDs outside and the foyer and one of our little kiosks. Uh, but, but I encourage you to, to go online and, and watch it as long as there's an internet and there's power. It uh, should be on there for the rest of your life until Jesus comes back to take us home. And then we'll get to hear from him, because he'll be awesome. Uh, a lot better than any one of us, I'll guarantee you that. Um, but, but last week, last week, just to catch you up just a little bit, we, I emphasized the point of, of how much Jesus values people. Of how much he cares, not just about the people that, that come into the sanctuary, that come into the church, that come into seven-day Adventism, not just those people, not just the people who claim him as Savior, but how much he loves just all people of every nation, of every tongue, uh, of all ethnicities. And, and so to sum up that point, we, we went to Matthew 5, and we looked at the story of Matthew 5, when, when Jesus tells, you know, he's talking there after the Sermon on the Mount, and he's talking to the people, and he, and he says this, he says, if you then... Therefore, if you one of these days, you happen to have a gift, and you're about to offer that gift to the altar before God, you're about to offer God this gift at the altar, and you remember while you're there at the altar that you have a sin, or that a brother has something against you, or a sister has something against you, leave your gift there, go be reconciled with your brother, and then come and offer that gift. And we translated that to mean today, today that translation, that application would mean something like this. If you were coming to church today, and as you were walking through those front doors, as you, as you were walking through those front doors to offer your songs of praise, your time and worship here together, you're about to return your tithes, your offerings, you're about to socialize, you're about to offer God all this time, whether it's two hours, whether it's three hours, whether it's four hours, all this time in worship and fellowship with His people. And He says, as you're walking through those front doors, you remember, you remember that someone has something against you or that you offended someone, whether it was on social media, whether it was face-to-face, -face, whether even you thought of it. If you remember that you have something against someone else or someone else has something against you, just stop what you're doing. Just stop what you're doing. Don't even go in there. Stop what you're doing, stop where you're at, pick up your cell phone, call that person, be reconciled with your brother or sister, be reconciled with your neighbor who has something against you, and then come and worship and sing and offer your tithes and offerings. Then come and do that. 
And, and many of us have never really fully understood the radical teachings of Jesus because he, he was a radical teacher. He was very forward thinking, emphasizing that, that people are really, 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 and in case you didn't get it, really important in this world. And it doesn't matter if they have a relationship with him or not. The point is he wants to have a relationship with them. And that's why they matter. And it doesn't matter if they're young or old. The point is he wants to have a relationship with them. And that's why they matter. And today, today in Isaiah, we're going to look at Isaiah. And we'll find ourselves that, that the same mistakes that Isaiah, the people in Isaiah's time, made are the same mistakes that we make over and over it's like it, it never it never dawns on us it's like things don't don't click and it doesn't make sense and it just doesn't sink in and we just don't understand and we just don't apply or maybe we hear it but we just don't 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 actually do it because we're like well well jesus said this but but you know later it says this and 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 then and we make excuses for our bad behavior we make excuses for not trying to reach out, and we make excuses for why we don't do things. And so Isaiah's culture, Isaiah's context, the people were caught up in this tradition. It's not that they were doing something wrong in their minds. I mean, in their minds, they were coming to the temple, they were offering sacrifices, they were worshiping, they were doing what God had commanded them to do, at least so they thought. But, but in the midst of, of going through the routine, routine became exactly that. It just became a routine and nothing more. Their religious life, their, their life of, of religiosity, the relationship that they, they had between themselves and with God affected no way how they interacted with one another. And they didn't care to love one another and to look after one another. And so if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open them to Isaiah chapter 1. And in Isaiah chapter 1, God, God is, is wrapping up and he's telling them, like, I don't, I don't care about your sacrifices. I don't care about your offerings. I'm tired of your new moon festivals. I'm tired of all these Sabbath rituals that you keep doing. I'm tired of this. You keep doing it and you think that you're doing yourself a favor and you think that you're doing me a favor, but you're not. And I'm tired of it because it's just a ritual to you. And so he says, he starts in verse 16, he says, Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil from your deeds from before my eyes, cease to do evil. And then verse 17, and this is a theme that you will see throughout all the prophets, throughout all the prophets, throughout the New Testament, throughout Jesus' teachings, throughout all the apostles' writings, you'll see this theme woven throughout. Learn to do good, seek justice. Notice it doesn't say, seek what you could justify. It says, seek justice. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. And then he, he, he has these words that we so often quote, we so often read them, and we apply them to our own lives, and we apply them to those people who sometimes feel like they're not good enough. And, and we hear God's, the heart of God in these following verses. And he says, come now. Come now, let us reason together. And what we, what we don't see in our English vocab today, what we don't see is, is the Hebrew intent behind these words. These are very passionate words that are written. And if you were to visualize what, what the author, what Isaiah is trying to write when, when he writes that God is trying to tell us, come God, the visual that you would get, it would be God on his knees begging and pleading with a rebellious people who just don't get it. And he's begging on his knees and he's pleading with them and he's saying, come now, come on, come on now, come, please come. We can talk about this. You think you're doing all the right things, but, but please come because we can talk about this. And, and maybe you don't see that your sins are cutting you off, and maybe you don't see that your sins are like scarlet, but that's why you need to come. Come now, he says. Come now. Let us reason together. And all of us know this. Most of us would know this. Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be, finish it off, white as snow. Though they be like crimson, they shall be white as wool. 
And you know, that's the G-rated version of the Bible in that section. When you go home, Google that verse and look up true meaning of though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Google it, and you'll find out what I'm meaning by the G-version. Because the image that we're supposed to get when we read those words are not supposed to be like, oh, scarlet, you know, sometimes a red dress looks pretty nice. It's, yeah, it's not bad. No, it's supposed to be an image of disgust. It's supposed to give you this reaction within you like, oh, that, that's gross. And, and what God is saying is, is this is exactly how you are. And you don't see it. And the people of Isaiah didn't see it, and we don't see it. And he says, you don't see it because you're not coming to me and you're not reasoning with me, but I can tell you I can make you clean. And notice what the verse doesn't say. The verse doesn't say, come now, let us reason together so you can make yourself clean. It doesn't say that. Notice what it doesn't say. Come now, let us reason together so you can buy some laundry detergent and just, you know, make your, make your sheets white again. Get some bleach. It doesn't say that. It says, come now. Though they be like scarlet, I will make them white as snow. It's something God does. It's something God intervenes in. And in the midst of it, you, you see that the heart of God, he's trying to reach a lost people. And they just don't get it. And so what does he do? Fast forward to chapter 6. In chapter 6, we see the calling of Isaiah. And Isaiah is there, and he's caught up in a vision. And he, he's not hesitant about what time it is. He knows exactly what time. He says, you know what? It was, I know this. I remember it like it was yesterday. It was in the year that King Uzziah died. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw a vision. I saw the vision of the Lord's temple, and, and the Lord filled it, and the train of his robe filled the entire temple. And not just that, then I saw two seraphim. It's another word for angels. He says, I saw two seraphim. They were hovering and flying there in the midst of the temple, and they had six wings, and with two wings they covered their face, and with two wings they covered their feet, and with two wings they flew, and they were singing one to another back and forth, and they were singing the, the most repetitive worship song ever written, ever created, and that will ever exist in the history of, of humanity. And the song goes like this, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole world is filled with His glory. And you think our songs are repetitive. Look at what Isaiah is going. It says they never stop, they never cease, they keep singing and singing and singing. And you know why? Because there's never a time when the earth is not filled with the glory of God. And so one angel sings to the other angel like it's the very first time he discovered and it made sense. And so he sings and he's like, hey, hey, did you know? Did you know that holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty? The whole world is filled with his glory. And, and the other angels over here, you know, he has his face covered, and, and he's probably thinking, like, where are you? I don't see you. And he has his feet covered, but he's flying in the air, and, and he's seeing, he's like, really? Really? Well, I need to tell you, because clearly you don't get it. And he probably emphasizes it just a little more. He's like, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole world is filled with his glory. And then the other angel, and you're probably like, stop. No, I'm not going to stop. Because they don't stop. And, and the other angels just ups it up a little more. He's like, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole world is filled with his glory. And, and there's never a moment when this world will not be filled with God's glory. Yes, there's horrible things, but guess what? God's glory is greater. And so they sing and they worship. And, and I imagine, you know, I imagine that, that one day... One day we're going to see these angels. You realize this? We're going to see these angels. And I doubt that, that we're going to come up to them and they're going to be like, man, you know what? That, that assignment that was given to me, I mean, day, day in and day out, all we do is sing. 
And all we do is sing this worship song that's the same chorus. I mean, I like your choruses. You guys just repeat them four times, but we. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't imagine that. I, I can't imagine because they never get tired of it. Because there's never a moment when God's glory isn't amazing. There's never a moment when his glory just ceases to be glorious. There's never a moment when God ceases to be awesome. And when you're in the presence of an awesome God, all you can do is sing and be like, whoa, you are holy. And the whole world is filled with your glory. Isaiah Z sees this vision. He sees this vision. And immediately, immediately he recognizes how ugly how sinful, how bad he really is. And he cries out and he's like, that's it. That's it. I'm done. There, there's nothing. Le- whoa, whoa is me. There's nothing. There, that is it. I guess, I guess that's it. And if you and I have that same encounter, we will come to the same conclusion. And we'll be like, that's it. And have you ever been there? Have you been at that moment? Have you experienced that moment when, when Jesus becomes so real to you? When, when his death on the cross becomes so real to you? When, when your sinfulness becomes a reality? It's not just something you think about. Yeah, you know, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm a bad guy. But, but deep down inside, you're really thinking, I'm not that bad. When your sin becomes the reality of what it really is and you recognize and you finally recognize and it finally sinks in and it finally clicks that, woe are all of us. For we, for you and I, for I, we're people of unclean lips and we deserve nothing but death and nothing else. Because when you're in the presence of the Almighty God and that's what you recognize, it's like, whoa. And when you remember that, that you and I are just as sinful as the rest of the world, it makes it a lot easier to remember to be merciful because we ourselves have received mercy. And the next verse is one of the most grace-filled passages that you'll see. The angel takes this tongue from the altar, and, and he brings it, and, and, he, and he touches Isaiah's lip. And this is how I imagine it. Remember, they're, they're singing the whole time. Okay, so I imagine this angel takes this tongue, and as he's taking this tongue, he's like, holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty. And as he's approaching Isaiah, he's like, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And he touches Isaiah's lips with his tongue, and he says, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are cleansed. Don't worry about it. Your your sins are cleansed. You have nothing to worry about. We have intervened. God has intervened. God has made you whole. God is, is, is Savior. God is merciful. God is mercy. God is love. And He loves you so much. And He has made you clean. And you don't have to worry about your past. You are good to go. And, and that is the power of love that transforms. And, and, and you're thinking probably right now, oh, but, but, but Pastor Nacho, it's because it's you don't know me. It's because you, you don't know what I've done. Well, no, the truth, you don't know what I've done either. And if you were in my shoes right now, you would be saying, I'm not even worthy to be up here talking to you. The reality is that when Jesus cleanses you, you are cleansed. That's it. And like I said last week, when someone dies for you, and maybe, I don't know, it does, does it not make sense? But when someone dies for you, when someone lays down their life for you, you don't have to go on worrying the rest of your life if they're on your side. They are for you. If someone dies for you, that means they are for you. And the awesome thing is, when Jesus dies for us on the cross, He calls us brothers. He says later on, I no longer call you a servant because a servant does not know his Lord's will, but I now call you brothers. And if we are brothers, we are heirs to the promise. 
co-heirs with Jesus. And that is powerful. That gives us hope in the midst of darkness. That keeps us going when we know we can't do something ourselves, but we know that someone stronger, someone better, someone bigger, someone greater than all of us is standing by our sides. We know that when we fall, He can pick us up again. When we trip, He's right there to lift us up again. Because He is better, He is greater, He is all that we'll ever need. And His name is Jesus. And so Isaiah, Isaiah calls out, and, and he continues this vision, and he sees him, and, and in verse 9, he says, you know, he, heard, he hears the voice of the Lord, this is Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9, and he's like, I, I heard the voice of the Lord, you know, and they were discussing amongst the, themselves, and they said, what should we do? I mean, there, there's these rebellious people, they're, they're, not, they're not listening, and what should we do? Who shall we send? Who shall we send, and, and who will go for us? And in a moment, without even thinking about it, Isaiah is there, and he's seeing this, and, and, he, and he, I imagine this. He, he raises his hand, and he's like, I'm right here. I'm right here, God. And God, I, I know I don't have much experience. God, God I, I know you just cleansed me, like, two seconds ago send me I will go send me God send me you notice what Isaiah doesn't do he's like job God uh, before I volunteer for this um, what what am I gonna do can you give me a job description God can, can you explain to me what exactly the details of my role will be when I begin and when I end and, you know, what exactly are my boundaries? Who should I talk to? Who should I not talk to? You know, who should I... God, do, do I need some work experience before this? Is there, like, you know, uh, on-the-job training that I can just go follow another prophet or something? None of that. He's cleansed. And he's like, I'm right here. Send me. He has no idea what he signs up for. No idea whatsoever. And that's half of the pastors in this world, I guarantee you. No idea what they sign up for. They're like, yeah, 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 right? And, and half of our volunteers, too, they're like, yeah, yeah, right here. And then we're like, yes, as pastors, we're like, yes, we got another one. Um, they have no idea what they're getting into. But they come, and Isaiah says, you know, here I am, send me. And, and, and then he gets the worst job description ever. The worst, read, read it. It says this at least from our human perspective. Verse 9, And he said, this is God speaking, And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Do you guys get what he's saying? God's like, Isaiah, go. I'm going to send you. I'm going to send you as my prophet. And you're going to go to a people who you will preach over and over and over and over again, and they just won't get it. And you're going to show them over and over and over. And you're going to show them again and again the love and the mercy that I have for them. And they're just not going to see it. And Isaiah doesn't do what we would do. Because we would probably be like, um, <clears throat> did, I, did I say send me? I, I meant, you know, use me once a week for an hour maybe. He doesn't say that. And notice what Isaiah doesn't say either. He doesn't say, here I am, God, fix me. Fix me that I may do this. He just says, here I am, God, send me. And you know, you and I, you and I should be thankful for Isaiah. For the kind of image that Isaiah shows us about God. And, and, and many of us, you know, we might think, oh, well, God, God can't use me. God, God can't never use me. If God knew my past, he wouldn't use me. Guess what? He knows. And he wants to use you. And if you think that, that God doesn't want to use you, I don't know what God you're, you're imagining. Because the God we know 
The God that we see in Isaiah is not a little peanut-sized God. He's a big God. He's not the God who's like, well, I guess, you know, they had a bad upbringing and it's going to be hard to use this one. No. The God that we see in Isaiah takes anybody at any time who's willing to say, here I am, Lord, send me. And he sends them. And we're so thankful that Isaiah, Isaiah accepts this call because you and I, whether you recognize it or not, we know and we are fruits of Isaiah's ministry. Have you ever heard, he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace? That's Isaiah. Have you ever heard, behold, the virgin will be with the child? That's Isaiah. Have you ever heard, yes, even youth will grow weary, but those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up on wings like eagle. You know, they will run and not grow, they will walk and not grow weary. They will run and not faint. Even youth will grow weary. Guess who that wrote? Who wrote that? That's Isaiah. And then in Isaiah 57, Isaiah 50, 53 actually, sorry, 53. He preaches year after year, day after day, about one day, though everything looks horrible in the midst of us, though we're going to be conquered by Babylon, though crisis is going to come, though it's going to look like there is no hope for us, guess what? One day, a Messiah will come. And he writes about this. The most famous verses about the Messiah are found in Isaiah. Isaiah 53, verse 4, start in verse 4. It says, Surely... He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. And all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And then fast forward to verse, the end of verse 12. Or verse 12. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore their sins of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. And this is why when Jesus begins his ministry, do you know who he quotes from? There in Luke he quotes from Isaiah. He says this. This, this, is, this is Jesus quoting, and he's like, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. That's Isaiah. Thank you, Isaiah. And then Isaiah ultimately points to, to the God who will lay down his life for his people and it's because of this we see jesus at the cross and i don't know if we just don't get it we just don't see it but but jesus there at the cross during his last moments while people are persecuting him while people are killing him while he's laying his life on the line for each and every one of us and while people still don't see who he really is he's able to utter some of the most beautiful words that we will ever find in scripture where he says father father forgive them Forgive the ones who are persecuting me. Forgive the ones who are killing me. Forgive the ones who are putting me on this miserable cross today. Forgive them because they have no idea what they're doing. And in that prayer, Jesus prayed for you and I. And he looks down on us. And he looks down on us and he's like, I laid down my life for you. I laid down my life for your neighbor. I laid down my life for your enemy. Can you do the same? 
Because we live like this world is all we're ever going to get. But Isaiah doesn't talk a lot about this world. He mentions it, but it's in passing because he's trying to point us to a world that's going to be better. To a world when the Messiah comes, it's going to be glorious. To a world when all of us will join those two angels in singing one day, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole world is filled with his glory. That's where Isaiah wants to lead us to. Here, today, tomorrow, this week, next month, next year, until Jesus comes. That we may spread the gospel. That we may look up and say, here we are, Lord. Send us. Because this world is just passing. The world to come is going to be awesome. Let's pray. Father God, we pray for the same vision that Isaiah had, that we may see your, you in your glory. And Father, that you may cleanse us and send us on our way. And Father, we love you for calling us always to yourself. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks again for worshiping here with us at Madison Campus. We don't want to just come to church. We want to be the church. So if you're interested in participating in ministry with us, please contact one of our pastors or one of the many volunteers you've seen today. We have a host of activities and opportunities for ministry, and we would love for you to participate with us. We also love hearing the incredible stories of how God is working through his people to change the lives of those in the Nashville area and beyond. If you have a life-changing story that you would like to share with us, we'd like to hear it. Please let us know by email at mcoffice at madisoncampus.org. Remember, we have a reason for everything that we do. It's our mission. Love God, love people, and serve the world. We'll see you next time.